Okay, I'd like to do a dedication uh, for, for, for the shir. Uh, uh, I'd like the shir to be dedicated to uh, Morris Merrim, that's Kevin Merrim's daddy, he passed away uh, on Sunday, and I think the funeral was yesterday. His name is Moshe Ben Arya David, and Kevin is a good friend of mine, and Damon and Gavin know him. Damon's known him for many years, and uh, we wish the family Aruchas Yamim and Oni Simchas. Right. Amen. Amen. Um, Kevin, I wish you long life in South Africa. I'm in Israel at the moment with Arthur, but uh, our thoughts and prayers are with you, my friend. I'm so sorry for the loss, really. And we're all thinking about you. And um, obviously, I hope this shares an aliyah for your father's neshama. Amen. So, uh, Amen. we were reading a Mishnah and I'm just going to give a couple of bottom lines before we go into the opinion of Rabbi Meir, as uh, Gavin uh, asked some pertinent questions last session. So the mix, uh, the mix comparison between the Mishnah and the Brisa, where they do a uh, cross-referencing, shows how similar it is. In the Mishnah, in 93b, it says, if one stole a pregnant cow and it gave birth, etc., or a wool laid at you and he shared it, he pays the value of a cow ready to give birth or the value of a ewe ready to be shorn. So the Gemara cites a relevant brasa, almost mimics it entirely. And it says the rabbis taught in the brasa, if one steals an ewe and he shared it or a cow that gave birth, the only thing it does in this particular case is slightly reverse the order, but it's talking exactly about the same thing. Um, according to the words of Rabbi Meir, uh, the thief, not the thief, the robber. The robber is a better way because we know a thief obviously pays multiple payments. But a robber who holds at gunpoint, um, when um, it comes before the court hearing, the court determines that he has to return the animal as well as all its byproducts. So if it was a pregnant cow and gave birth, he has to return the calf. If it was stillborn, he has to return the fetus. Um, if it's a wool uh, laden, if it's an ewe laden with wool, he has to give all the shearings uh, and every bar product, as far as that's concerned. So it's a slightly different opinion to Rabbi Yehuda, who we said the stolen animal is returned to the owner as is. What do we mean? That the stolen animal is returned to the original owner in its present shawl, non pregnant state. So what happens then is additionally the robber pays the owner the value of the wool or fetus at the time of the robbery. Because all agree that whenever a robber does not return the stolen article itself, he must pay whatever its full value was at the time of the robbery. The robber doesn't, however, pay the value of the subsequent appreciation that occurred while the animal was in possession. So we used a very simple example um, that was brought in the commentaries where if a cow is worth 100 years, uh, and there's three trimesters uh, of a cow giving birth, the first trimester it was worth 110 years, in the second trimester 120, in the third trimester 130, and when it eventually gave birth it would be worth 100 years for the cow and 50 years for the calf. What would happen in that particular case according to Rashi is the robber would return the non-pregnant cow, obviously it gave birth, and that would account for a hundred zoos credit. Now he still owes, if he started in the third trimester, 30 zoos. So then he would pay the balance of the 30 zoos in cash because the non-pregnant cow went from being worth 130 zoos to 100 zoos. So he has to make up that shortfall. He does not, however, have to follow Rabbi Meir's opinion if you're following Rabbi Yehuda's opinion and return the calf that's worth 50 zoos. So again, the calf is his, but he gives the 30 uh, zoos in lieu of the pregnant state increasing the value of the animal at the time. But as far as the ewe is concerned, we have the same thing, is that the ewe might have had, uh, when the, the robber had to return it at the time of trial to the original owner, be completely shaven. And therefore, he returns the ewe. And whatever the hair growth was at that stage, say it was worth only 20 zoos, he gives the extra 20 zoos in cash. But if it grew hair to 40 zoos, 
at that particular point, he gets to keep that 20 zoos of appreciation as long as he recompensates the original owner from the timeline of the robbery. Okay, but the appreciation is his according to Rabbi Yehuda. So that's Rashi's explanation of Rabbi Yehuda. The Rosh is saying that the physical change of the animal renders it the property of the robber. Whereas Rashi is saying that the animal doesn't intrinsically change, the byproduct change. So, from example, from a fetus to a calf. That's why the robber gets to keep the calf because it changed from a fetus to a calf. And if the hair growth was moderate and went, uh, the wool growth went to a full afro, let's call it, then that's changed significant in the hair or the wool. And therefore, that belongs to the robber. But the ewe hasn't intrinsically changed. So therefore, he can return the animal when it was the cow or the ewe. The Rosh deems it different and explains Rabbi Yehuda as saying, look, the animal changed physically. And when the physical attributes of the animal change, the robber gets to keep the animal and has to compensate the original owner the full amount in cash at the time of the robbery. So instead of returning the animal in 30 zoos of cash, he has to give 130 zoos. But he still gets to keep the appreciation of the calf. And the same with the wool-laden animal at its maximum hair growth at the time of trial. And, and he recompensates only at the time of robbery that appropriate hair growth and animal cash value. And this was an issue Gavin and I discussed. Gav, make sense? Before we proceed, now we can focus on Rabbi Mir. Yeah, that no, it does. Under the okay. So good. So Rabbi Shimon is saying now a different opinion. Uh, so firstly, how did this whole uh, thing come about? Well, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Is that um, there was a pasuk that says he, uh, he that which he stole, uh, he has to uh, if he stole it. He has to return that which he stole. So there was a superfluous and he stole at the end, which is coming to say that if the original item stolen has changed so much physically, it doesn't resemble the original article, the cash equivalent has to come back because it's based, that's the biblical directive based on the puzzle. The rabbinical directive based on the puzzle, it's not based on the puzzle only, it's based on the concept of allowing the thief to do teshuva. Why? Because if he broke into Builder's warehouse and he robbed the place at gun, let's say at gunpoint, because thievery is penalties of double, etc. But let's say he held up a truck full of planks and tools and whatever the case may be, and he he used those planks of wood and nails and screws and glue and whatever, and he made himself full furniture for the home. He's not going to, after putting so much time in, want to return. Uh, that because of his effort. So what the Deshuva process allows him to do is give the cash equivalent of what he stole in the raw planks, but he doesn't have to return the article because those raw planks, once finished and planed and fixed, don't resemble the original article. Now that is a reversible physical change. So it's technically uh, is returnable, it's not a permanent physical change. We discussed this with dying wool and permanent dyes and indigo and everything else. He's saying that he's not going to want to schlep. So from a rabbinical standpoint, he can still make a teshuva if he replaces the value of the planks. Okay. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, Rabbi Shimon has a different opinion to Rabbi Yehuda. We're going to go through where that uh, the differences lie. And he says we view it as if it was an article appraised and placed with uh, the, him according to its cash value at the time of the robbery. So what are we actually saying here? Is that we appraise its value at the time of the robbery, and that's what the robber actually pays, meaning that it's as if he's a custodian, and we say, like, look, he's paid, and he has to look after the article. Now, whether the article appreciates or depreciates, at the end of the day, the timeline at the time of the robbery, even if the trial is six months later, Gavin, he still has to make restitution at what that article was worth at the time of robbery. And it was compared to iron sheep assets that the wife brings in a marriage. 
that irrespective of the appreciation or depreciation of the property, after 20 years, if they get pre, uh, if they get divorced or he predeceases her, in which case the estate could pay, either way, whatever the value was of the property at the time that investment was worth, that is what's paid to her back from either the estate or the husband's divorce settlement. doesn't matter if the area went from Yeovil and it became derelict to a township, or it went from Branston and is now prime property. Either way, it's done at the time point at the time of the Ketubah. So to this, it's done at the time point of the robbery, irrespective of the trial happening later. Clear, clear as day, guys? Clear, yeah, yeah, clear as day. Okay, good, good, good. So we're going to go into the next part now. And this is trying to find out Robbie Meir's opinion. So it says... What's the reason rubbing my ear for ruling that the robber must return the cough and it's shorn wool? In other words, because rubbing my ear's reasoning is that uh, we don't know yet. But what did rubbing my ear say, uh, Kevin? You're present, Damon. Yeah. Uh, uh, what did rubbing my ear say? What was his position? Uh, yeah. Did, did, uh, yeah, okay, Kevin, because we didn't hear you 100% because you broke up. But, uh, Kevin, if you heard, it's right. What, what did Robin Mayer say is it that the, the robber mustn't benefit? He can't keep the. Excellent. He can't keep the uh, he can't keep the shearings. He has to hand them back Excellent. because they mean there must be no benefit to him. Excellent. That's absolutely perfect. So Kevin had the perfect answers that Robin Meir says both the stolen <coughs> and any of its byproducts have to be returned to the original owner. The reason why we want to know, Kev Sham, I know you've had a bit of a day. I can see you nodding. Are you okay? No, no I'm not nodding at all, but I am I'm finished. But, I, but I'm, I'm not nodding. nodding. I'm nodding. I'm, yeah. I'm fully awake now. Okay, your eyes did close. I'm watching you guys like hawks. No, no, you're not. Your eyes are closing if you think my eyes are closing. <laughs> they're all closing. They're closing. Uh, they're, they're not. I'm tired. They're droopy, but I'm not I'm not closing. <laughs> I haven't fallen asleep. You can ask me any question. I don't know if I can answer any questions, but you're welcome. Okay, maybe it's the ask. angle, because the angle was like this. Yeah. So maybe it's the angle. All right. So it's listen. the angle. I haven't fallen asleep. I'm not, I know when I fall asleep, more or less. No, fair enough. All right. You guys so, wake me up. All right. So what we're saying is now, Exactly as Kevin said, we know what Rabbi Meir rules. The question is why? Why? So there can only be two answers to that, guys, and I'm going to keep it simple and bullet point. Number one, maybe because he holds that an article uh, stolen uh, undergo, uh, that undergoes a physical change actually remains in its place. So what does that mean? It means that Ordinarily, the uh, rab rabbinical opinion is that a physical change in the article means that it affects acquisition for the robber because he has to return the item, the exact item that he stole. If it changes its physical properties, he no longer can return the same item that he stole. He can return a different item, but then he has to give the cash equivalent. Now, why, why is that? We discussed there was a biblical uh, a superfluous phrase that was never superfluous. It was coming to teach us that, but also to aid to Shiva. But at the end of the day, if the animal, if the animal or the article is not in existence, he has to pay the cash. It can't say it's disappeared. So that's option one. That Rabbi Meir holds, unlike the rabbis, that a change remains in its place, meaning the physical change never, ever affects acquisition for the robber. And it always remains... Uh, uh, the original owners. That's option one. Option two is that he's doing a special penalty against the robber because he doesn't want to encourage the robber to make any product, uh, byproduct, profitable for him. Because think about this you can do a robbery and you have to, at worst case, you return everything, but you're still making a profit. Like on the currency, can you see what I'm saying, Gav? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a, it's a you can you can create a massive uh, scam and and set up a massive business. Yeah, exactly. By stealing, you can steal like a thousand sheep and then you can start a big business. 
Correct. And even if you return it, you're still making money. If you steal are only in the business of stealing from forex places, even if you return on the money, you can still become a millionaire from the exchange rate. And, and there's no interest on it either when you give exactly. it back. Exactly. No, especially if you're a robber, there's no penalty either. Correct. Because you're a robber. So you don't have that gunpoint. Yeah. Talking about that, there was this one guy I found a floor with uh, with the currency of, of Bitcoin between countries or something, okay, where he was exchanging it. So if he bought, let's say, uh, he'd spend ten thousand dollars, and when he sold it back, he'd give back a thousand dollars immediately. So he kept repeating the thing over and over again. It's not stimulus, but so like you said, you know, you can benefit very quickly if you're smart. Yeah, I actually read, heard about that, and I read the article. His his profit was less, but he had millions. Whatever. Yeah, he was spending billions and making billions quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so that's those are the two opinions of Rabbi Meir. And as Gavin brilliantly remembered last time, is what's the practical difference between the two? And the difference is where the animal underwent a physical change and deteriorated. Why? Because if Rabbi Meir holds that a physical change doesn't affect the acquisition then even if the animal depreciated on account of the change, the robber can return the animal in its present state and say to the owner, behold, what is yours is before you. In other words, uh, listen, there's no physical change um, that uh, Rabbi Ma acknowledges, so I don't care if it looks different. Here's your animal back. You've been paid. But if Rabbi Ma holds that a change does affect acquisition, then it's only by force of that special penalty that the robber must return the calf and the shorn wool. Because where the animal depreciated on account of the change, the robber acquires the animal, in that case, because of the penalty, and he would actually have to pay the owner the full value of the animal at the time of the robbery. So do you get what we say? So just, just, just repeat that. If I want to say that a change doesn't affect acquisition, then I can give you back your scrawny animal, which was decent, but I, uh, I neglected it and became malnourished. And then the physical change doesn't affect acquisition, okay, at all. So yeah, if, 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 if you give it back as is, yeah. Yeah. So if I give it back as is, um, um, then, and it does, then I can just return the, the animal uh, to you, okay. So, so, um, um, so, so that would be the implication. But if Rabbi Meir holds that that is the case, that generally a physical change doesn't affect acquisition, but here he's imposed a special penalty against the robber. The robber, at the end of the day, would have to keep the animal and pay me the cash equivalent when it was in its normal. Uh, optimum weight at the time of the robbery. So it's a special opinion that he holds, but it's not because he holds that a physical change doesn't affect uh, uh, hold that a physical change doesn't affect acquisition. But that's the actual practical ramification. Make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why he doesn't allow the animal to go back and just pay the difference uh, as opposed to uh, him keeping the animal, but no, no, no. So what we're saying is the you you can't have it both ways. Gap, that's exactly the point. You can't have it both ways. If his rational uh, approach is that at the end of the day, physical change doesn't affect acquisition. There are some there was an opinion of some rabbis that did state that, and we proved in each case it's non conclusive. And it could be an exceptional case. We went through a whole list of to nine that did that. So if he holds that a physical change doesn't affect acquisition, and in particular, you could say in this case, because deterioration through malnourishment could be remedied with food. It's not a permanent physical change, by the way. He might even hold by that, by the way. But let's just say uh, he holds in general that that's the case. What happens is that the animal could be returned to the original owner, and there's nothing the original owner can do about it. He has to take the loss. But if there's a special um, reason 
that it's a penalty against a robber that uh, he can't benefit from his crime. Then when the animal depreciated, the robber would lose out by having to keep the scrawny animal and pay the full value at the time of the robbery. You see the difference on, a, on depreciation. We already discussed the issue of appreciation. Appreciation, the robber doesn't benefit Kevin. But Gavin, what we want to know is, does the does the robber benefit with depreciation? And that only determ is determined by Rabbi Mayer's rationale. For Dealing with a simple issue of Rabbi Mayer. So basically, we know that Rabbi Mayer is the most stringent against robbers ever. Any thing that a robber steals. It doesn't matter how much he physically changes it um, and uh, the sort of byproducts that he can earn from in terms of appreciation. Rabbi Mayer says he returns both the item he stole and the various byproducts it can produce. Whether a cow was pregnant with a fetus and it becomes a cow, or you had medium-sized wool and it grew under the jurisdiction of the robber, now became a 1970s Afro and is worth more. Everything gets returned. It's not the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda and uh, Rabbi Shimon. Let's not go into those previous opinions. I think we've done them ad infinitum. So let's just concentrate on Rabbi Meir. Now, Rabbi Meir says that the, the robber does not benefit from appreciation. And I have to give this example because we're dedicating this year to uh, uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin's father, as, as we did in the introduction. And Kevin Marin's father, it always helps to add that part of the Mishnah. So it said, obviously, um, if he steals a, a, a pregnant cow that gave birth, he steals a... Um, obviously steals a you um, and a Krishan, et cetera. So what, what the discussion is, is that what is the value of an animal from a non-pregnant state to a giving birth state and a pregnant state? So all we said, bottom line, the robber steals the uh, pregnant cow. What happens is a non-pregnant cow is worth 100 zoos, the three trimesters of a cow, for example, first trimester earns an extra 10 zoos, so that cow's now worth 110, second trimester 120, third trimester 130, as an example. And the calf is worth 50 zoos, half that of a cow, so that when the robber steals it, uh, it went from a state maybe at the second trimester of 20 zoos, um, and it now went to 50 zoos because of the calf. So um, what Robbie Mann is saying is that all of it has to be returned to the original owner. But what we are asking is why? Because there can only be two reasons. In other words, what um, what, what are the two reasons is that if not, Sham Gavin, you were, I was wrong to start the show so late last night, you were exhausted. We're talking about a change of domain. A change of domain is a factor, but it's not a factor in this particular case. What we are talking about is a physical change in the animal. And what we are saying is that um, if the animal physically changed from a pregnant animal to a non-pregnant animal, then it should, by all intents and purposes, belong to the robber, and the robber then has to give the financial equivalent because of such a significant um, uh, physical change. Because we said that um, what what happens is biblically there was the superfluous statement of, that talks about stealing, and it uses the term "if he stole," meaning it mentions it twice, and that's coming to teach if it doesn't physically resemble the item that was stolen, the robber gets to keep whatever that item has changed into and gives the financial equivalent at the time of the robbery. Um, and that's worked out at the trial date, which is later. So we say Rabbi Mayer says with appreciation, the robber does not benefit. So we say, what are, what could be the two reasons? There's only two. The one is that he doesn't hold 
that a physical change renders it the acquisition of the rubber. In other words, the change remains in its place with the original owner. The other alternative is that he holds a penalty against the rubber because he doesn't want him to benefit at all from that transaction by earning off um, the transaction, even though the original owner is getting recompensated because that time period has allowed him to earn off the appreciation of the animal's worth from a pregnant state to now a state having the animal having given birth and thus the value has increased. So we are saying, well, what difference does it make with those two opinions? And we're saying that on a theoretical basis, uh, they are worlds apart, but what is the practical ramification? And that ramification is when the animal underwent a physical change and deteriorated. Okay, because we said that if Rabbi Meir holds that a physical change does not affect acquisition for the thief, then even when the animal depreciated on account of the change, the robber can return the animal in its present state and say to the owner, behold, what is yours is before you. But if Rabbi Meir holds that a change does affect acquisition, and it's only by force of a special penalty that a robber must return the calf and the shorn wool. And when the animal depreciation um, on, on account of the physical change, the robber then basically has to acquire the animal and will have to pay the owner the full uh, value of the animal at the time of the robbery. So a bottom line of it is, is that if it's a penalty base, Rabbi Mayer can use that penalty when he, when he sees fit, meaning if it's to the original owner's favor, uh, he can remove that uh, uh, sort of penalty. And when it um, is not to his favor, he can add uh, that penalty to the robber. So the robber, the robber never benefits from appreciation, but the robber suffers greatly if he left the animal in a worse state and left it uh, without nutrition and malnourished. Now, if you want to hold a principle that a change effects acquisition for the robber, then sometimes it'll work out to the thief's benefit, not the thief, the robber's benefit, and other times it'll work out to the benefit of the original owner. So that's why we want to know, because we would prefer, in a world of fairness, that it never worked out for the robber beneficially. And it was always swung in the favor of the original owner, if possible. Does that make sense? Why do you have do you guys have any questions before I go on? We've done this. No, I'm fine. Okay. All right. So, Kev, no questions. You good? Thumbs up? Okay. So now we're saying, well, how do we know how Rabbi Meir holds? So we have a separate Mishnah that adds clarity on this issue. And it's in the 96th Mishnah. Remember, we're doing the 90, uh, the Mishnah in the 93rd Duff. Okay? Even though we are Duff number 95, we're still going line by line. So the Mishnah says, if one stole an animal and it aged, or slaves and they aged, he pays their value as of the time of robbery. So what do we mean? Is aging is very different to malnutrition. Malnutrition could be a case of a reversible change. You just have to feed the animal and it will eventually rectify if it's not too far gone to the previous state, albeit the fact that it does cost the person feeding the animal. But I think we can learn the principle best by an irreversible detrimental change, and that's aging. Because in that case, you can't, uh, you've got to actually uh, draw your line in the sand one way or other and figure out how does uh, Rabbi Meir deal with the uh, physical change of uh, that's permanent, such as aging. So, we have a right to mention it says the robber acquires the stolen animal or slaves and compensates the original owner by paying him their value at the time of the robbery. Because what's happened, say there's a trial five years later where uh, the slave finally speaks to somebody and says, you know what, I was kidnapped and now I belong to somebody else, but nobody ever listened to me because I was just the slave. I never had free choice. 
but somebody listened to him and realized that the person that the slave was stolen from was a friend of his, or he recognized him in the marketplace. And now, after five years, the guy's not exactly at the same level of uh, uh, physical strength anymore, and even more so for an animal because an animal's lifespan is less. So as the animal ages, its value diminishes and its capacity to do work. So what does Rabbi Meir say on this? He says, with respect to slaves, the robber may say to the original owner, behold, what is yours is before you. Now, what he's saying is not that at, uh, the physical change doesn't affect acquisition. When he's talking about slaves, it's a different reason. Why? Because if you look at, there's a Gemara in Kedushin 22b that says, slaves are compared to real property, meaning land. And just like a, a land can never be stolen, it always remains the domain of the owner. So even if a robber has stolen a title deed, and he says he owns it, and he undergoes a physical change to the, uh, to the property, maybe he's... Uh, damaged it, or maybe he's improved it and grown things, who knows? At the end of the day, you can't remove property, put it in your pocket and leave. The land doesn't leave. The only thing that changes is the ownership of the title deed. And so too, in condition 22b, slaves are compared to real property, so they're never legally stolen. And therefore, that physical change, such as aging, isn't taken into account because the robber actually never ever acquires a slave because it's seen as the slave having aged and depreciated while in the original owner's legal possession. And the robber is only returning him to him physically like returning the title deed. So that's not a proof for Rabbi Meir. And in fact, what it says in the Gemara is that Rabbi Meir um, uh, disputes the Tanakam, and now the Tanakam is general, the, generally the anonymous rabbinical opinion, only with respect to slaves. Okay, so he's saying that that, uh, that you can return it as is. But if he's saying it's only in respect to slaves, what is that implication in terms of property? That, that is fine. That's what, that what is fine? What, what that, is it? That with property, um, prop property does uh, property you got. Well, it's the same. What well, property? Well, no, property animal, you can, said, you can return in its. That's, yeah, that's, no, no, no. I'm saying the same. Really, they're the same. Yes, maybe, property. Maybe it's what he's saying about property. No, 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 stop. I made a mistake. Okay. I, I apologize. I'm tired. Okay. I used the word property in my head, but the missioner said a slave and animal. And an animal. So, oh, yeah, that's just, so I, yeah, I that's apologize, just... Gavin. I was tired. I'm so sorry. So what I'm saying is, if Rabbi Mary distinguishes that a slave can be returned as is because it's like property in that it never leaves the domain of the original owner, even if the robber has it, like having a title deed, the guy's still on the farm. Just make a difference, the original owner. So then we understand. But when he's disputing just the issue of a slave, it means then that he doesn't dispute the issue of an animal, which means if an animal was stolen by the robber at gunpoint and uh, five years later they found out because the, the robber was wearing a mask or whatever the case might be, or the animal had a branding and then they found out it was the original owners, the robber can't return the animal as is and say, um, say to him, um, well, your animal is before you. Okay, uh, don't worry about the fact that it's almost dead now from old age and you're not getting your value out of the animal. Uh, I've returned it. He's saying, no, it's made a permanent physical change, especially one of deterioration where it's aged. And therefore, uh, Rabbi Meir actually agrees with the Tanakama with respect to animal that he pays the value at the time of the robbery. So now what it means is as follows, is that the animal belongs to the robber because the change affects acquisition for the robber. And therefore, what happens is the original value, say, say the, uh, the ox was worth in its prime 200 zoos and it's five years on, it's only worth 120. 
Then the uh, robber keeps the animal at 120 zoos and recompensates the original owner 200 zoos for how strong his animal was worth and young at the time of the robbery, even if it was years before. So in this case, this is a proof to try and prove that Rabbi Meir holds uh, that um, a physical change does affect acquisition for the robber. Because it says, and if it should enter your mind to say that Rabbi Meir holds that a change remains in its place, then even in the case of an animal, well, the robber should be able to return the animal and say in its present depreciated state, behold, what is yours is before you. Rather, do you not learn from this that Rabbi Meir holds that change does affect acquisition and he's ruling here that the robber must return the offspring and the shorn wool is simply a penalty that Rabbi Meir poses when the changed article has appreciated. So what it's using here is a proof to say, well, surely by the fact that he doesn't have any issue with an animal seen as land where in that particular case, it never changes, uh, um, it, it never changes, um, what do you call it, ownership. And in the case of an animal, he he uh, he doesn't bring that same point. So it would imply he feels opposite about an animal compared to a slave. And therefore, it would seem to agree with the Tanakama, who says that a physical change affects acquisition uh, um, for the robber. But except the Tanakama seems to suggest that both slaves and an anim and animals uh, effect acquisition as they age for the robber, and the robber has to recompensate for what they were worth in their prime. But because Rabbi Meir only disputes that fact, uh, well, agrees with, uh, seems to dispute the fact of slaves uh, being able to transition ownership, it implies he agrees with the Tanakama that physical change does affect acquisition for animals. And therefore, if he does, it seems then he would be imposing a penalty against a robber if there is appreciation because he doesn't want the robber to gain anything and it, he wants it to be a determinant, sorry, a, um, a deterrent yeah. against robbery. Sorry, Gaff, my blood sugar is low. A deterrent against robbery, right? So that's what the Gomorrah uh, is proposing. But the Gomorrah rejects the proof, and you, there's an interesting reason, okay? Because the Gomorrah says, it might be, if you actually look at the Mishnah properly, that Rabbi Meir, in his response, that disputes the rabbis, only with regards to slaves, was not presenting, in fact, his own opinion. But Gazi was simply stating an objection to the rabbis, even according with their own opinion, as follows. So what I could be saying is as follows, that if you read the Aramaic properly and you choose slightly different punctuation, it could say, according to me personally, and this is Rabbi Meir speaking, change doesn't affect acquisition. And even a stolen animal that depreciated on account of a physical uh, deterioration of aging can be returned to the robber in its present depreciated state. But the, according to you, the Tanakama, who says that change does affect acquisition, at least you've got to concede to me and agree with me that in the case of a slave, that you would agree with me that change does not affect acquisition for a different reason. And that is, is compared to land, and land cannot be legally stolen. So thus, even if the stolen slave undergoes the physical change of aging, the robber doesn't acquire him uh, at all, but returns him to the original owner as is. Okay? And then the rabbi say to no, slaves are like movables. So there's some halakhic opinions that see him as land. We see a slave as a movable um, asset, which can be stolen. And therefore, when they age and undergo physical change, the robber acquires them, same as an animal if there's a deterioration or physical change, and must pay their full value at the time of the robbery. So if you interpret Gauss, Rabbi Meir's opinion like that is, uh, compared to what we read a little bit earlier, we've got no clarity as to how to resolve the issue. Is that in general, does he hold that change effects acquisition? Or does he just say it's a penalty that he's applying to robbery, to deter robbers? You see why it's non-conclusive. Depends how you read the Mishnah.
Any questions before I go on, Daz? Okay, uh, if you put a thumbs up, you don't have to add, then I know you guys, good. Uh, Arthur gave a thumb up. Kevin, you okay with that? Thumbs up, or you have a question? Thumbs up. A thumbs up with Kevin. Good, good, good. Sound good. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so it's so it's not clear. It depends how you uh, it depends how you interpret Rabbi Meir. Um, so the Gemara says, okay, maybe there's another way to resolve the inquiry. Come learn a resolution from the following Mishnah. Now, where's this Mishnah? We're going to hit it in the 100th daf, please God. I feel like this is a marathon. Anyway, um, I'm sure you guys do too. Thank you. Um, so what does it say in the 100th Mishnah of Baba Kama? If a shop merchant gave wool to a dyer, okay? Well, sorry, if one gave wool to a, a, a dyer who's got a shop, right? Uh, and he instructed them to dye it for him red. And the dyer dyed it black. We instructed him to dye it black and he dyed it red. So what are we talking about here? Is there was no Woolworths or Edgars in those days, guys. You didn't take your finished clothing off the rack. There were guys that had different sort of trades. You had blacksmiths. I don't even know what black lives matter if you can use the word blacksmiths anymore. Who knows? But uh, you had blacksmiths. You had people that dyed fabrics. You had leather tanneries. You had all sorts of uh, trades um, that we take to, uh, for granted today in finished manufactured product. So what would happen is if you uh, shaved your you and uh, you didn't like that natural dirty sort of beige color that the wool came in or, um, and you wanted to dye it a different color, you would take it to a haberdashery shop and there would be a professional dyer there and you would select the color you wanted the wool or fabric dyed in. Why are we saying fabric? Because it's the same thing with cotton. Now what happened is the shopkeeper didn't really listen to you properly because he had a million customers and the color that you wanted, he dyed it a different color. Okay, it wasn't a purposeful act of uh, defiance, but he didn't listen to your instructions. Uh, so Robbie Mayer says that he pays the owner the value of his wool, meaning the original value of the wool before it was dyed. Okay, even though it's now worth more to those who need red wool. So what does Rashi mean? Rashi means that you've got the pre-dyed state of the fabric that's maybe worth a hundred zoos. The minute you put a dart to it, it's now taken labor and time and now sells for maybe 130 zoos or 150 zoos because it's a finished product in an awesome color. Some people like black clothing, some people like red. So it's worth more as a result of it being dyed to those that want that color of dye. Okay, so what we are saying is that it is worth more uh, to the somebody that wants a different color dye, but he doesn't return. Uh, he doesn't return the misdyed uh, wool to the uh, owner of the wool. What he does do is he compensates him the cash. I'm going to explain what that means now. So it implies that the value of the wool, yes, he pays, but the value of the wool and its improvement, he does not pay. Okay, which means. Um, that, for example, if raw wool was worth 100 zoos, for example, and the red wool, like if we look at the price, the second case was sold for 130 zoos. The dyer keeps the 30 zoos of appreciation and he profits 30 zoos minus the amount it cost him labor and time, etc., to dye it. So what we are saying is in this is a case where uh, the person that misunderstood the instruction profits. Now, please bear in mind the original owner of the wool is not out of pocket because if his raw wool was worth 100 zoos, he gets paid back 100 zoos. But the improvement goes to the robber. Now, what do you mean he's a robber? The guy uh, dies wool in the haberdashery business. So we say he's like a robber in a certain respect. Is that if you pay somebody to do a task for you and they don't listen properly, 
you're getting back something different to what you expected. And therefore, uh, he robbed you of your outcome in a way. It wasn't purposeful. It wasn't derelict. It wasn't breaking the law. But his lack of attention to detail is what caused it. Uh, does that make sense, guys? Um, you know, it's like delivering a different product to the company, to the customer's expectation. So what we are saying is he's seen as a thief, but he's not seen as a purposeful thief. So all he has to return is the original value in cash, but the appreciated value as a result of the dye and the labor gets to go to the uh, haberdashery shop to the dyer and not to the original owner. But what does that prove? It proves that if it should enter your mind to say that rubbing my ear holds and a change does not affect acquisition, okay, then he would actually have to return to the owner the value of his will and its improvement. So what are we what are we actually saying there? Is that um, the word value, even the Rashpa brings us, is not actually the accurate word, even though it's used in the Gemara. It means that if a change doesn't affect acquisition, all he would have to do is return the dyed wool itself and not the value in cash. Do you get what I'm saying? Why is he not giving the original wool back, guys? That's the question I want to ask you. What does it imply when he doesn't give the original wool because, back? Because that's not what he wanted. He wanted it red and he got it black. Yes. So but, he's not that's what I mean. He's yeah. not happy with the outcome. No, that's it's an true. improvement. That's it's an true. improvement. That's true. But what we are saying here is you could say to the guy, oh, listen, just keep the difference. Uh, here's your wool back. So this is proving that the minute you make a change and it doesn't resemble the original article, even if somebody didn't listen to instructions and his after said became an inadvertent robber, a shoy gig, meaning he just didn't listen to the instructions properly and he just didn't fulfill the mandate, it's still a form of robbery. And the fact that he doesn't return the dyed wool means that that dye, the minute you dye the wool, it should now become the acquisition of the robber. In this case, the inadvertent robber, the person who dyed it the wrong color. He should keep it and then just, uh, if a change affects acquisition, and just give the cash to the original owner of the wool, which is exactly what he does do. So that's a proof that change does affect acquisition. Because if change never affected acquisition for the inadvertent robber, the original mm. owner would be given back the misdyed wool. He'd just be given it back, and he gets to profit from the fact that the wool now has appreciated in value to somebody that wants that color wool. Do you see what it's trying to prove? That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's trying to prove, Kevin, that at the end of the day, that um, if Rabbi Meyer says that the haberdashery owner that misunderstood the instructions and therefore is an inadvertent robber because he didn't listen properly, what it actually means is that um, in in that but in that particular case, um, uh, in that particular case, a change does affect acquisition because the robber gets to keep it. Um, uh, and has to only give the lesser cash equivalent. It's not lesser to the original owner because his wool undyed was worth 100 zoos. Now that it's dyed and it's been fixed, it's worth 130 zoos. But that benefit is to the un inadvertent robber that didn't listen to instructions, which proves when it physically changed from a bland wool that was untreated to now being dyed, that physical change affects acquisition for the inadvertent robber. And that inadverted robber has to give the cash amount at that time of robbery, inverted commas, not listening to his instructions properly. And so the original owner gets his money back, but the improvement in the change goes to the robber. Now, it's not entirely unfair because the inadverted robber still spent time, material, etc., elevating it. The fact of it, he was dozy. Now he's got to find somebody that wants red wool instead of black wool. But he did, in fact, make improvements. Okay, but it's comparing this. <clears throat> it's comparing this to the first bracer, and it's saying the first bracer. We see that uh, um, there is a penalty. Okay. There must be a penalty because why? Is because if you say that a change affects acquisition, 
like the case of the dyed wool by Rabbi Meir, then what happens is that when a fetus changed to, uh, changes to a calf, who should get the benefit of that? Guys, who should get the benefit of yeah. that? The owner. The, no, no, the rubber. The rubber, the rubber, I mean, because it's yeah. a, a change of its acquisition. Exactly. So what it's saying is we're seeing a contradiction between Rabbi Meir in this case compared to Hayward in the first price. So we're saying, look, there's got to be a penalty. Why? Because the one is a case of not listening to instructions properly. So you kind of like irritated the guy, robbed him of his time by not uh, being service delivery in the way that you said. But you gave him back what he what his will was worth. So you um, you fixed it you fixed it up, uh, and there's no penalty because you didn't plot and scheme to break the law. You just were dull as you and didn't listen. In that case, when you actually held somebody up at gunpoint uh, and you changed the animal, or the animal changed itself by being a, feet, a, a fetus and now becoming a calf, that won't affect acquisition for the owner, not because Rabbi Meyer holds that a change doesn't affect acquisition, but he is not going to allow the robber to benefit in this case from the uh, changing, affecting acquisition, simply because it's going to benefit the robber and he would rather the original owner benefit, which means in the case of depreciation, Rabbi Meyer wouldn't apply that rule and he would say, fine, change effects acquisition, there's no penalty. The robber gets to keep the scrawny animal that, that was a beautiful animal that he neglected and he's got to give the full amount in cash of what that animal was worth in its proper state. So in other words, Rabbi Meir is applying the penalty to ensure that the robber never benefits and that change does affect acquisition, but not in uh, but uh, in, in this particular case, we still find a problem because if change affects acquisition and it's not a penalty um, from the from depreciation point of view, then uh, it, uh, then Rabbi Meir is saying it, it has nothing to do with the change affecting acquisition. Because otherwise, it's going to work to the robber's uh, benefit of depreciation. It's just going to return the animal. The very fact that he has to keep the animal when he let it depreciate, uh, in this case, we can find that out by his opinion of uh, dying or in the haberdashery shop. So, in conclusion, Rabbi Mayer sees that at the end of the day, when there's appreciation by the robber, he says the robber must give back everything. If there's any improvement on the time from theft to the time of the trial, the rubber gives back not only the product, but the improvements as well, as Gavin particularly said, uh, articulately said, as well as if the animal depreciates due to the robber's neglect, then uh, the change does affect the acquisition. But in that case, um, he's going to make sure that the penalty is installed so that the robber keeps, just like in the case of the wool, uh, the, rob, the robber keeps the emaciated animal and gives the full value of the animal in the case of depreciation. So we see that Rabbi Meyer actually imposes a penalty. It's not that he doesn't hold that a change effects acquisition. You, you get what I'm saying? He applies that penalty to the benefit of the original owner as you can see from changing circumstances, which, guys, I think is very fair. Yeah, because it'll encourage uh, people, robbers, to steal me. They can, then they can hold on to an animal and get the benefit from the wool, or if it's it pregnant and it gives a cough, then, is the, then it's uh, all they need to is give the, the capital value of, of, the, of the ewe or the, or the, or the cow at the at, at date of, of, uh, of theft. Correct. And it not only does that, Kevin, it does one further, as you pointed out the other day when you learned on Friday night, is that at the end of the day, if the animal is neglected, uh, it did offend you that the original owner now has to feed the animal and get it back in a drought mm. state. And the animal is suffering. The animal doesn't suffer yet because the robber is to be stuck with the loss. So this is going to promote the robber to treat the animal well because he doesn't want to lose money, not because he's a good person. You get what I'm saying? He's going to lose money. He has to keep 
he gets paid, punished at the losing end of the deal, always, because he committed a crime. And it's not the case when it was an accidental robbery because he just was moggy and didn't listen to instructions. It's a form of robbery, but it's so mild because uh, that the change effects acquisition and we don't penalize the person that didn't listen to the dying instructions properly by using all his labor to have dyed the wool and returning it and having a loss in his labor and material costs. He keeps the improvement because he'll find another customer who wants that color. All he has to do is reimburse the original owner the cash equivalent of what that wool was worth. So Rabbi Mayer's opinion is also very smart. Okay, now, Tomorrow we're going to deal, not tomorrow, either tomorrow or on um, uh, Thursday, we're going to deal uh, with uh, a different version of the previous discussion because it's worded in a slightly different way. It's another way to interpret, but it's going to come to the same result. So okay. Thursday I might have a...